I want to thank the team for leading us. And I want to welcome all of you again. And I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, there's a Pew Bible or the Version Bible app. You can download it. Um, but we're going to be in the Gospel of Matthew, which is the first book of the New Testament. And we've been spending time as a community over the last weeks in something called, a portion of teaching called, the Sermon on the Mount. It's Matthew chapter 5 to 7. And so you can turn there. And um, this is really the greatest sermon preached by the greatest preacher. And the Sermon on the Mount, it gives us a picture of life in the kingdom of God. It's like it, it baptizes our imaginations in the possibilities of what life looks like lived under the reign and rule of God. It gives us a picture of being right side up people in an upside down world. And as we study the, the Beatitudes, this famous portion of teaching, uh, these statements of blessedness called the Beatitudes, as we study these, we're going to see that really Jesus blesses things that our world would not bless. And it seems upside down until you realize it's actually the world that is upside down. And all of a sudden then, Jesus' teachings and his statements of blessedness look right side up. And so let me read them to you. Again, these are called the Beatitudes. Starting in Matthew chapter 5, verse 1. I'm going to read all the way down to verse 11. It says this, Now when he saw the crowds... He went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who, who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So these beatitudes, they need to be understood in light of the good news that Jesus announced. That these Beatitudes, they're not describing eight different ty types of people. They're really describing eight different characteristics that are being formed in kingdom people. Uh, these are characteristics or qualities that are being formed in people who've believed the good news of Jesus and are being changed by that good news. This is a picture of people who've embraced and been changed by the good news of of Jesus. So these are not entrance requirements to get into the kingdom. They're not about behavior modification. They're not about jumping through hoops to earn divine approval. These beatitudes are characteristics and qualities that God is forming in us by the Holy Spirit. This is what people who come under the reign of God begin to look like. And what you notice as you study the Beatitudes is they're actually interconnected. They mutually reinforce one another. In fact, if you, if you put the Beatitudes into what's called a chiastic structure, you be, big word there, you, be, you begin to notice these parallels between the first one and the fourth, and the second and the fifth. In fact, Jordan made me this amazing chart. Uh, if you look at this, the poor in spirit are more likely to be merciful. Because they recognize their own depravity and need for mercy. Those who mourn over their sinful condition are more likely to pursue purity of heart. The meek, uh, meekness being strength under control. They're more likely to be effective peacemakers. And those who hunger and thirst for righteousness are more likely to be persecuted in an unrighteous world. And so what you find is that these Beatitudes, they actually reinforce one another and build on one another in a really interesting way. And the first of them 
is this statement, blessed are the poor in spirit. And so that's where I want to start. That's what I want to talk about this morning. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven or kingdom of God. So the Greek word translated as blessed is the word makarios. And this word is notoriously difficult to translate with an English word. And many different attempts have been tried. Here are a few. Fortunate are the poor in spirit. Approved are the poor in spirit. God smiles on the poor in spirit. One commentator tried to bring out the meaning of this word by saying, you lucky bums, to get the kind of spirit of it. Daryl Johnson, a local pastor, author, scholar, suggests things like, right side up are the poor in spirit, or in alignment are the pure in heart, or in sync with the spirit are the peacemakers. These are beautiful attempts or, or English words that are trying to bring out the nuance of this Greek word makarios. Flourishing are the poor in spirit. That's another attempt. Uh, there's one English translation that some of you might be familiar with that's not very good. It's happy. Happy are the poor in spirit. That translation is a little bit misleading because of our kind of shallow view of happiness. For us, happiness is circumstantial. Happiness is what happens when things go our way. It's this subjective feeling of, of you know, we feel great. But it creates problems when you get to the second beatitude. Happy are those who mourn. That doesn't quite work. Right? Try to figure that one out. Happy are the sad. A and really what this word conveys is more of this objective pronouncement that God makes over our lives. Not a subjective feeling that we have. It's about divine approval. It's this objective reality, not this subjective feeling like happiness. Makarios is the face of God smiling on us. I remember reading an interview with a great writer, and the, the interviewer asked her, you know, how did, how did you become a great writer? Who did you read? Who inspired you? What, what did you use to structure your practice? And she said in response, she laughed, and she said, no, 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 that's, that's not why I'm a good writer. I'm a good writer because when I was a little girl, I would walk into a room where my dad was sitting, and his face would light up. That's why I'm a good writer. There is no other reason. I always thought that was so interesting because even technically it's not true what she said, but why did she say that? And that anecdote speaks to me about this longing we have for affirmation, for approval from those who matter to us, right? To walk into a room and have someone's face light up is blessed. And it speaks to having this secure basis from which one can develop their gifts and talents and take on the world. And it's almost like Jesus is saying for those who have been frowned on the entirety of their lives, here is good news. The face of God can smile on you. God smiles on those who are poor in spirit. He shows favor to those who are poor in spirit. It lights up his face. And so the next question becomes, what does it actually mean to be poor in spirit? And so I want to talk about, to help structure the remainder of our time, this message, I want to talk about what it means to be poor in spirit. How do we cultivate a poverty of spirit? And why being poor in spirit is not just blessed by God, but is a benefit to others. And actually a beautiful way to live. So I want to talk about what it means to be poor in spirit. How do we cultivate a poverty of spirit? And why being poor of spirit is not only blessed by God, but is beneficial to others and a beautiful way to live. Those three things. So the first is, what does it mean to be poor in spirit? Jesus says, this is blessed. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. 
Well, there are two Greek words for poor in the New Testament. Penes and pitahos. Penes and pitahos. Now, I know you didn't come probably going, teach me Greek words, but that's what's going to happen right now. Um, Penes is used to describe people who own no property and are always working to survive, right? People for whom leisure is a luxury. That's the Greek word penis. Now, pitahos describes people who are so hard done by, people who are so destitute that they have to, they have to beg from others. In the words of one scholar, it's all on the, on the PowerPoint, the first refers to those who only have the bare essentials, the second refers to those who have absolutely nothing and know it. Which word do you think captures the voice of Jesus here? Which, which Greek word do you think is used? Pitos. Right side up, blessed are those who approach the God of the universe with open hands ready to receive. Blessed are those who approach the God of the universe with nothing but their need. Blessed are those who approach the throne of grace as destitute beggars, for this is the only way in which we can truly come. Jesus said, blessed are those who have nothing to offer and know it. Blessed are those who come empty, waiting to be filled. Blessed are those who have nothing to contribute to their salvation but the sin that made it necessary. Now elsewhere, in Jesus' teaching, he gives this beautiful contrast between poverty of spirit and being proud of heart. It's this parable or story about a tax collector and a Pharisee who go to the temple to pray. And so if you feel like it, you can actually flip in your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke two books over, uh, chapter 18, verses 9 to 14. I'm going to read you this parable. Well, it's nice to hear the sound of flipping pages. Still pretty old school. That's great. It's Luke 18. And it's verses 9 to 14. Lord, I hope I got that right. But you'll, you'll, it's in chapter 18 for sure. Here's what it says. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else. What a description. Right? Like I, for, for some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else. Everybody's favorite person. Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified or in the right with God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. And so the tax collector in this story gives us a picture of what poverty of spirit looks like. And the Pharisee, he gives us the contrast. He gives us a picture of what it looks like to be proud in heart. And we can learn a lot from the Pharisee. And we can learn a lot from the tax collector as to how to cultivate a poverty of spirit. So let's look at the Pharisee. You notice that he focuses on all his merits. He says, hey, I fast twice a week, I give to the temple, I pray long in public prayers. Right? He focuses on the good things that he does. Second, you notice that he ignores his faults, or he doesn't mention them. Right? If you want to be confident of your own righteousness, that's the way to do it. Focus on your strengths or the good things you do and ignore all your faults. And then the third thing the Pharisee does is so important, we're going to spend time here. Because he does something that we all have a tendency to do. 
or at least I do, and I assume, hopefully, I'm not alone. So we'll camp on this one. You notice the Pharisee focuses on people who seem worse than him. This is key. He says, thank you that I am not like the robber, the evildoer, the adulterer, and thank you that I'm not like the tax collector. He focuses on someone who seems worse than him. This is a well-rehearsed route. Because we can always find someone who seems worse than us. To be honest with you, that's why I watch The Bachelor. Because I watch that show and I feel great about my marriage and my relationships. And I think, man, I've got some things figured out that these people don't. And I feel great at the end of it. Like, this is just me being honest with you. So, um, and, and what that approach does is it allows us to deceive ourselves quite easily. So James Boyce, in his commentary, don't judge me about the bachelor thing, by the way, in case you're tempted to do so. Let's listen to this quote instead. You will find someone, this is what he says, you will find someone who is prouder than you, and although you may still be quite proud, you will congratulate yourself on being humble. You will find someone who has a strong, or who has strong fits of temper, And although you too have a temper, you will congratulate yourself on being more moderate in your temper than he. This is what happens when we start playing the comparison game. As far as we know, we can usually find someone who seems worse in certain ways, and then we feel more confident about our own righteousness. But what if the standard of righteousness is not other people? What if it's the person of Jesus and his commands? That changes things. Because even if you read more of the Sermon on the Mount, you find things like Jesus saying, no one can serve two masters. You cannot serve God and wealth. You find him saying, put your treasure in heaven. You find him saying, do not judge or you too will be judged. Or let your yes be yes and your no be no. Anything beyond that is evil. Or... Do not resist an evil person. Whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Or again, do not worry about anything. Those are his commands. Those are the things he says. And if that's the standard, I fall short. And so what we tend to want to do then is change the ideal, change the standard. That's what culture tends to do. Right? Change the ideal, or we want to hide the real. Pretend like we're not falling short as much as we are. That's what religious people tend to do. Or we can stand naked, metaphorically speaking, before the standard and admit that we fall short. I can't live up to the standard that Jesus sets. I can't make it. It's like trying to swim to Hawaii. Some of us will get closer than others, but none of us will make it in the end. We will all sink at some point in the attempt. If this is the standard, and I try to reach it on my own, I'm going to sink. And we might even say, well, you know, I'm not sure if I put much authority in the scripture. I'm not sure if I believe all that Jesus said, but it's not just God's commands. It's not just the person of Jesus and the teaching of Scripture. It's also our own conscience that tells us this. Let me just give you an illustration and a story. And if you don't enjoy the illustration, you'll enjoy the story. Imagine if as a child a recording device was put around my neck. And it only switched on and recorded me when I was making a moral judgment about someone else. So everything I said about kids on the playground growing up or other classmates or, you know, when I started to drive other drivers on the road or, you know, people on reality TV shows or coworkers or strangers or family members, right? Every time I pronounced a moral judgment on someone else, it was recorded. And I die and I stand before God. And he doesn't say anything. He doesn't quote scripture or remind me of the Ten Commandments. He doesn't quote the book of Leviticus at me. He simply touches the recorder button 
and I get to listen to years and years of moral judgments I pronounced on others. All of my virtue signaling, all thousands and thousands of denunciations. And then God speaks. Where do you stand in light of your own moral judgments? And I think, honestly, not only would I be ashamed if others were to hear the recording, I would be silenced before God. I think every honest voice would be silenced before the throne of God. Because all self-deception and posturing is stripped away. And what I'm trying to say is, we fall short by God's standards. Right? The Ten Commandments are good. If we followed those, most of the problems in the world would go away. We don't follow them. If the commands are good and we don't follow them, what does that make us? Kind of bad. And so it's not just God's commands, though. It's also our conscience that they join together to act as a mirror that shows us the stains on our character. And in light of that, we can either harden our hearts and refuse to look at the mirror or by grace start to move towards becoming poor in spirit. Here's, here's the story. My wife, Deandra, and I, we're in a season of change, and things are emotionally charged in our house. And so last Friday night, we got into an argument. And then, on Saturday morning, we got into an argument. The argument continued. Um, my wife calls it building understanding. We were... We're just building understanding. Yeah. And, and if you're wondering, uh, do I have permission to share this? Of course I do. I don't want to build any more understanding. Okay, so like, <laughs> obviously. Your pastor's not a moron, okay? Okay, and so argument. We weren't yelling and saying mean stuff, okay? But, but we were arguing, and the children saw and so Saturday morning, we drop the kids off with my mom, and we go for a walk to talk and connect and build understanding. And so we come back, and, and we get the kids, and my mom pulls us aside, and she says, just so you know, um, don't get mad at them, but the kids told me that you guys were fighting. Is everything okay? And I was like, yes, we're just building understanding. It's fine. <laughs> And then on Monday, Deandra had lunch with a friend, and our daughters are in the church's children's program together. And in their classes, they exchange prayer requests on pieces of paper, and our friend's daughter got Mila's prayer request, which read, quote, please pray that my parents would stop fighting. And, <laughs> and the friend was like, is everything okay? And we're like, yes, just building understanding. Like, what? And I'm like, children... You're letting out all of our secrets. You're going to make us look bad. I'm the pastor. Like, st stop. And then it made me think, like, what if all our secrets came out? Like, I can't pretend I'm righteous in that moment. Who could be confident of their own righteousness in that moment? I can't pretend that I've obeyed God's commands consistently all the time, or even met the demands of my own conscience. I've fallen short. And so when we get to that place, it's like, hey, I, I'm not good enough. If that's the standard, I can't meet it. I, I'm not good enough. I'm not righteous enough. I'm not confident in my own righteousness. When we get to that place, then the first word of this sermon is for us, blessed are you, blessed are the poor in spirit. There is help for you that cannot come from yourself when you get to the end of yourself. Blessed are you. This is why when people truly encounter God, they don't come away from that encounter confident of their own goodness. They come away in awe of God's amazing grace and glory and greatness. See, we don't see that in the Pharisee. He's not looking up to God. He's looking down at others. The Pharisee didn't pray, God, forgive me that I'm not like you. I don't love like you love. Forgive like you forgive. Give like you give. I'm often ungrateful and bitter and resentful of other people's successes and happiness. 
that probably would have been true. But he didn't pray that. He prayed, God, thank you that I'm not like him. Instead of, God, forgive me that I'm not like you, he prayed, God, thank you that I'm not like him. But the tax collector is different. He, he begs for mercy. He asked for a new beginning, and it was given to him. He refused to believe in one sense that he was too bad or too far gone to receive grace, mercy, and forgiveness from God. Whereas the Pharisee continued to think, I am too good to ask for grace, mercy, and forgiveness from God. You see, when it comes to a relationship with God, sin is not the barrier. I know that sounds strange. But sin is not the barrier. Your, your past mistakes are not the barrier. Sin can be forgiven. Sin can be forgiven. Self-righteousness is the actual barrier because self-righteousness ignores the fact that we need to be forgiven. There's two attitudes that I've encountered again and again. And both put the focus on the self. They are one I am too bad to ask for God's help. I'm too far gone. I'm too bad to ask for God's help. The other is, I'm too good to need God's help. These two well-worn, well-traveled ruts. I'm too bad to ask God for help, and I'm too good to need God's help. Like, we can get stuck in either option. I'm too bad to receive grace, or I'm too good to ask for it. Shame or self-righteousness. And I think this is the cultural view of Christianity. This is one of the critiques, and I get it. Ah, Christianity, it either produces unnecessary guilt and shame, or it produces self-righteous people who always look down on others and seem superior or think they're superior. Unnecessary guilt and shame or self-righteousness and neither option looks appealing. Right? I'm so bad, I'm always looking up at people. I'm so good, I'm always looking down on people. Neither posture can lead to healthy recipro- you know, reciprocal relationships. These are attitudes that religion tends to produce. Shame, <coughs> self-righteousness. And religion is not the answer. Religion is part of the problem. When religion becomes a man-made attempt to justify ourselves before God, the focus is on how good we are and how well we can perform and what we can do. But that will always and only lead to self-righteousness when we are performing well or despair, shame, and guilt when we know we're falling short. And our joy and our sense of peace will be totally dependent and totally based on our performance. Because it's all about what we can do, what we can accomplish, how good we are to somehow earn God's favor. That is not Christianity. There's a third path. It's called the gospel. The gospel, the good news of Jesus, is not about how good we are. The gospel is about how good God is. The gospel is not about what we can do. It's about what God has done in Jesus for us. And so the gospel doesn't lead to self-righteousness or constant guilt and shame. It actually leads to a humble confidence. Humble because we were sinful enough that Jesus had to die for us. But confidence because we were loved enough that he was willing to die for us. The gospel helps us avoid either of those pitfalls that are so repugnant to people. But the gospel is only good news for us who admit we have need. And the only way we do that is if we acknowledge our own poverty of spirit. And so I offer these lyrics as a litmus test because the proud soul shudders to sing these lyrics 
but the poor in spirit clutch at them like a lifeline. It's like you're swimming to Hawaii and you get to that point where you're so tired and you know you're going under the water and you know you're going to sink and you know you're not going to make it and then someone throws you a life preserver. They throw you a lifeline. That's what those lyrics are for the poor in spirit. Nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to the cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress. Helpless look to thee for grace. Foul I to the fountain fly. Wash me, Savior, or I die. Jesus speaks over that and says, Blessed are you, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. And I want to capture the beauty of this vision for humanity, because we hear it, and I think our reaction is, oh, that sounds to our modern ears like kind of poor self-esteem or worm theology or a distorted self-image, but it actually produces beautiful, attractive people who are wonderful to be around, because to be poor in spirit is to kill pride and produce humility. The result is that the poor in spirit are refreshingly honest about their own strengths and weaknesses. Poverty of spirit is where posturing goes to die. And wouldn't that be a refreshing thing? The poor in spirit are willing to admit they are wrong. They can receive and learn from criticism. And they're willing to say sorry and forgive. To be poor in spirit is to be empty of oneself. And therefore have a lot of space for God and for others in our lives. The poor in spirit are present with you when you're in their presence. The poor in spirit pray passionately out of their sense of poverty. The poor in spirit are merciful because they recognize their own need for mercy. They're wonderful people to admit your failings to because they understand you and they don't judge you. They know that whatever you have done, but for the grace of God, they could go there too. So they're safe to be honest with. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing that not only God declares to be blessed, but is actually beneficial for all our relationships and interactions with one another. And so the prayer is, instead of full of pride, which is a struggle, Instead of full of pride, God, make me poor in spirit. This is the blessed life. The kingdom of heaven belongs to the poor in spirit. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. That it does confront us sometimes in uncomfortable ways. It confronts our pride. confronts our desire to be in control and manage our image and curate our image comes against all of that and it humbles us profoundly when we understand that not only your commands but our conscience accuse us and tell us we've fallen short but in that place of repentance and humility and brokenness you come and meet us with grace and mercy and new beginnings and you pronounce your word of blessedness for the kingdom of heaven belongs to the poor in spirit so father remove pride from our hearts and lives and make us poor of spirit and i pray that in the awesome mighty name of jesus amen